we can get into the Word of God. Now we can get, turn with me in your Bibles to the Song of Solomon, chapter 6. The Song of Solomon, chapter 6, as we continue our verse-by-verse study of the Word of God, we find ourselves in chapter 6 of the Song of Solomon. And the title of this message is Fighting Fair, Part 3. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come down upon us as we study the Word of God. Give us the clear understanding of your word. Break up the fallow grounds and the hard hearts, Lord, so your word can fall upon good soil and bear fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Song of Solomon chapter 6, Fighting Fair, part 3. Now, in part 1 of this study, we saw two things that we're not to do during conflict. Number 1, we're not to react, meaning that we're not to reenact what someone has done to us. Number two, we are to allow God to change the other person, meaning that we leave people in God's hands. Only God can change the hearts of people, so we leave people in God's hands. In part two of this study, we saw like we are told to have liquid myrrh dripping from our lips, which means that we're forgiving and we're going to bury the past. Myrrh was used for burial. So liquid myrrh dripping from our lips means that we're going to bury the past. And we saw how Solomon, uh, this woman, his wife, uh, described Solomon's hands in in very beautiful terms, uh, meaning that we're never to put our hands on our wives in a way that is not loving or, or that is not godly. And now we're going to look at how to communicate with our spouses. <clears throat> because, men, we need to pay close attention to this. Because we're bad communicators, and and we need to understand how to communicate and how to talk to one another. Now, we left off with Solomon's wife going out to look for him, to apologize for ignoring his needs and acting in selfishness. And this is a free lesson today. Always be quick to apologize when you have offended your spouse. Because the more time you allow to pass before you apologize, Satan will give you a reason not to apologize and give you justification why you shouldn't apologize. So always be quick to apologize. Look at verses 1 and 2. Where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone to his garden, to the bed of spices, to feed his flock in the gardens, and to gather lilies. Solomon's harem asked her, where is your beloved? And she responded by saying, he is in his garden and feeding his flock. Notice how she knows right where to find him. Men, when you're in conflict, does your wife know where to find you? Notice how she can answer to his whereabouts. That she is not calling all of his friends, asking him, have you seen so-and-so? He was not in some bar or some club drinking and dancing his problems away. No, he was in his garden feeding his flock. Gardens in the Bible seem to imply the place to get along to be with God. Adam got along with God in the Garden of Eden, according to Genesis 3 and verse 9. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to get along to be with the Father before he went to the cross in Matthew 26 and verses 36 to 46. Men, let us go to our gardens when we're in conflict with our spouses. Let us go to the place to get along to be with God. Let our wives know where to find us when we're in conflict in our homes. See, this goes back to the whole shepherd king idea of chapter 1 that we studied. Ladies, this is why it's so important to have a true shepherd king as a husband. Not some weekend shepherd king that he's only a shepherd king only on Sundays. Because you will know where to find him. He will be in his garden feeding his flock and getting along with God. Many people want to know, where can I find God? You can find God in the garden, in the garden of prayer. Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane to talk to the Father, to get along with God. 
You want to know where to find God? God is in the garden. He's in the place of prayer. He's only one prayer away. All you have to do is go to the garden of prayer, and that's where you will meet with God. This is why Satan will do all he can to keep us from our garden of prayer. It's in the garden of prayer that we, we, we find solutions to our situation because we're in touch with the all-wise God. We go to the garden of prayer. That's where we find God. Whenever you feel distant, wherever you feel that God is far from you, he's in the garden. He's in the place of prayer. That's where you find him. That's where you go to look for him. Look what he says there in verse 3. It says, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Notice he said, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. She is saying no matter what conflict comes our way, we belong to one another. She knew where to find him and he knew where to find her. Ladies, notice how she didn't run home to her mama when conflict came. This is one of four major problems in all marriages. In-laws. The man's mother coming in between him and his wife. And the wife's mother coming in between her daughter and the husband's. In-laws. Back away from your children's marriages. Or as my boys used to say, fall back. Keep your noses out of their business unless there is some kind of abuse going on. I want you to notice. Watch this. Because this leads me to four major problems in all marriages. According, according to what we're going to see here, according to experience, this, these four, I'm telling you, leads to all problems in marriages. Number one, the man's mother. The man's mother. Number two, the woman's mother. Haven't you noticed a common denominator there? Number three, sex. And number four, money. These four lead to all conflict. Now, there are some other things, but I guarantee you it springs off of one of these four. All problems. Now, with this in mind, here are three things not to do when you're in conflict. A, don't run home to your mother unless there's abuse. B, don't stomp out the door. Are we going to come back to that? C, don't go off with your friends to talk about your spouse. Don't do it. Men, don't do it. Ladies, oh, 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 I come back to that. Look at verse 4. Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Terza, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. I want you to notice something here. Notice what are the first words to his wife as they are coming together for reconciliation. They were words of praise. He didn't say, that's right, you need to come to me and apologize because you were so wrong. You were not just wrong, you were so wrong. No. He talks about her beauty. He sings her praises. Man, how often do you tell your wife she's beautiful? Or when was the last time you told her she was beautiful? Man, you don't want other men to deposit beautiful points into your wife's emotional account. And none of this stuff, well, well she knows. She knows. Well, well how? Well, but, well, well, because I, you know, I told her, you remember when I told you, you know, that, that day that I, I took, well, when was that? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, you, well, you know, you know, my memory, that's not what it used to be, you, you know. Cut it out, man. Cut that out. Solomon immediately talks about her beauty. He immediately, watch this, sing her praises. Oh, man, do you sing your wife's praises? Do you sing her praises? Or are you always talking about what she doesn't do and what she needs to do better? Solomon sung her praises. Look at verse 5. It says, turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. 
Solomon is saying, turn away from me because you are just too beautiful for me to even talk to you. This is called forgiveness. This is called reconciliation. He's humbling himself before his wife. Look at verses 6 and 7. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing. Everyone bears twins and none is bearing among them like a, a piece of pomegranate or your temples uh, uh, between your veil. Now, behind your veil, should I say. Now, these are the same words that he used on their honeymoon, showing her that his love for her has not diminished since that night. Couples, has your love for one another diminished or has it deepened since your honeymoon? So often couples grow apart in marriage, especially when children start to come and the wife pours herself into the children and the husband feels neglected and he pours himself into his career. Maybe you hear and I just described you and your situation. My desire is that this would change as you apply these principles in this book. This couple's love deepened as time went on. See, this is the thing. Ladies, I'm going to let you in on a little man talk. This is man talk. Man talk is, well, let me just start with this. First, you pour yourself into the kids. And mothers, I know how you are. You're like, you know, my kids, you know, these are my babies. You know, they need me. And you have this need to be needed. Therefore, these kids supply that. And, then these, and the kids, and they need me. And they, they just kid. You can fend for yourself, but they need me. They need the bottle. They need the diaper chain. They need to be walked and looked after. They need, they need, they need. And the husband is like, don't forget the one who helped you to have those babies. Yeah, but they, but they, they need me. They, they need me. And, and then let me let you in on the man talk. Here's the man talk. Man talk, when we talk to one another, and graduation, kind of graduate, this graduation season, graduation, it's like, oh, one down, two more to go. And that's how we talk. And we like, we can't wait. Because, see, we can't wait to get, get them out of the house. You know why? This is what we think, ladies, ladies. This is moms. This is what we think. We're like, okay, they're gone. Therefore, I get to get my wife back. And then you know what happens? Boop, here's another kid. And you're like, I can't wait another 18 years for this. And then it's like, okay, woo, two down. Okay, and then all of a sudden I get my wife back. Uh, then here's another one. It's like, are you kidding me? And then finally you're like, okay, whoo. Oh, that was a long time. Okay, now I get my wife back. They're grown, they're gone, the kids. Oh, my wife. Ah. You get to sing the praises, and then all of a sudden, grandkids. <laughs> and this thing starts all over again. It's like, are you serious? See, this is, how, this is what men, this is how men think. And you're like, how can men think that way? These are babies, these are kids. And they're like, I just want my wife back. That's all I want. So th this, is, this is the thing we have to understand. When the kids start to come, you pour yourself into them. The man, he pours himself into his career. And I'm just hoping that things would deepen between you, that you understand taking the principles in the Word of God, and you understand how to date one another, how to have dates, and how to draw closer to one another even as the kids come, and all that sort of stuff. This book is so important for us to study. This is why we're studying it. Look at verses 8 through 10. It says, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. It says, my dove, my perfect one, is the only one the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughter saw her and called her blessed. And the, the queens and concubines, they praise her. It says, who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? This is called forgiveness. Solomon is saying, you are my dove. My perfect one. He is saying, I love you so much that I don't even remember what you did to me. You're my perfect one. You can do no wrong. This is amazing. Isn't this how God is to us? 
He loves us so much that he purposes in his heart that he will forgive us and remember our sins no more. Isn't this what Jeremiah 31 verse 34 says? I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is what Solomon is doing with his wife. He's, he's treating her in such a way. He's treating her like God would. Oh, this is an important word for us. Solomon is teaching us men, men, fathers. You don't realize how important our roles are in the home. We're told to be godly in the home because when our children grow up and hear that God wants to be our heavenly father, the first thing our children are going to do is compare us, compare God to us. That's the only frame of reference they have. So our children are going to ask the question, God, you're my heavenly father. Are you going to run out on me? like my earthly father ran out on us? God, you, you're my heavenly father. Will you be distant and aloof like my father was in the home? God, you're, you're, you're my heavenly father, but if I do one thing, will you treat me cold like my earthly father did me? I did one thing when I was a teenager, and he hasn't spoken to me since. Is that how you're going to treat me? See, that's all they have is this frame of reference. All they have is to compare heavenly father with earthly father. Man, what kind of father are you in the home? Because, see, how a boy is going to treat his future wife is how you're treating his mother. How are you in the home? Are you being godly in the home when she makes a mistake? And she will. When she makes a mistake, will will you constantly bring it up to her? Or will you, like Solomon and like God, remember our iniquities no more? He treated her in a beautiful way and showed what forgiveness was all about. Look at verses 11 and 12. I went down to the Garden of Nuts to see the verdure of the valley to see whether the uh, vine had budded and the pomegranate had bloomed. Before I was uh, even aware, my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. This is the ultimate of reconciliation. He forgives her to the point where he is parading her. He's now parading her in his chariot in front of all the people. In other words, he is treating her as if the conflict never took place. This is true forgiveness. Treating a person like nothing has ever taken place. Oh, do you forgive like this? This is the example Solomon is showing us. This is why we need the Lord. He gives us the power of his Holy Spirit in order to do what we can't do on our own. We can't forgive like this. This is how God forgives. Therefore, we need God's power to help us to forgive like he does. This is why this is so important. Look at verse 13. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. And what would you see in the Shulamite, as it were, the dance of two camps? I want to bring your attention to the, to the name Shulamite. That was actually a nickname because in Hebrew, her name, Shulamite, is a feminine form of Solomon. It's a feminine form of Solomon's name, which means she belongs to me. Do you see how they drew closer to one another through conflict? This verse ends with a party. They had a big party. Showing us two things. Number one, conflict brought them closer together. And number two, conflict brought joy in the end. What helps us to forgive others when we realize how much we have been forgiven? Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Are you having a hard time forgiving someone? Maybe it is a father that walked out. Maybe it is a a mother who allowed something bad to happen to you. Maybe it was an ex, some ex 
somebody. If you have a hard time forgiving, I want to encourage you to look to the cross. Look to the cross. See how much you have been forgiven, and it will help you forgive others. See Jesus as dying for you personally. It's easy for us to say, oh, Jesus died for the sins of the world. It's another thing to say, Jesus died for my sin personally. He died for my unforgiveness. He died for my anger. He died for my hatred towards my father, my anger towards a mother. He died for my lust and my uh, porn addiction and all kind of stuff. He died for all of us. See, when you start making it personal and you say he, he has forgiven me of all these things, my abuse, my neglect of my family, when you begin to see that, and see that Jesus died for your sins personally. It will help you. It, you will begin to say, who am I to hold something against someone else when I have been forgiven of so much? Now, we're going to look at how to communicate because we don't know how to communicate. We don't know how to talk to each other. When we're in conflict, the first thing that comes to the surface is anger. And when we're mad, we get loud. And nobody's hearing each other. Nobody. So I'm going to help you. We're going to go through these quickly, but I'm going to help you on how to communicate. 13 don'ts in communicating during conflict. Number one, don't speak too soon. Or don't jump the gun during conflict. Hear your mate out. I am terrible at this. I cut my wife off too soon. I cut her off all the time. And I'm going to tell you why as we continue down. Proverbs 18, 13 says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame to him. I, I got this bad. I need help here. I need y'all's prayers. I need help here. Number two, don't confront your mate publicly. Do it behind closed doors. Proverbs 12, verse 4 says, A wife who causes shame to her husband is like rottenness to his bones. You shame him in public or in front of the kids, a part of him dies. And this is why when you see him, he's just a little bit more subdued because you killed a part of him. Never do it in public or in front of the kids. Number three, don't confront your mate before the kids. You say, well, I'm behind closed doors. and Well, maybe you need to close another door, the bedroom door, because don't do it in front of the kids. Number four, don't use the kids. Don't bring them into the argument. Johnny, you remember I told your daddy that last night. You were there. You were playing with your truck, but you heard me. No, don't do it. See, now that my kids are older, that my kids are grown now, I said, you know, I, I do it now. They're grown. Hey, uh, you heard when I, I told your mother that. you? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Or they're saying, Dad, yeah, but you were wrong when you, you can't bring. Don't bring your kids into it. Number five, don't say never or you always because they will dig up a time 10 years ago when you did. Don't say never. Don't say you always. No, what, what you talking about? What, five years ago, you remember it was raining outside and you, they would do it. Number six, don't get historical. Don't bring up the past. Have liquid myrrh dripping from your lips, meaning that you bury the past. Number seven, don't raise your voice. Talk sweetly. Well, I can't help it. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stirs up anger. So don't raise your voice. Number eight, don't call names. Jerk, dog, B word. Those are the nice ones. Some of y'all got a mouth on you, and you can woo. Cursed them up one side, down the other. You got, or as my, my boys used to say years ago, you got a mouth on you with, with an F on the end. Mouth. And you can curse like a sailor. No, you don't do that. Number nine, don't mention family. My mother said you'd be no good. No. No, don't, don't do that. Men, this is, this is for us. Uh, number ten, don't win. 
Press for resolution, not victory. Many of you are like me. You're former athletes, and you still have that competitive edge, but physically you just can't do it anymore, but you still have that edge. And so you're like, you know, you're pressing for victory, and you're like, yeah, I won. I'm back winning again. Yeah, I won. No, press for resolution, not victory. Number 11, don't condescend. Speak person to person, not like a parent reprimanding a child. Ladies, you have this bad. Your husband is not your child. If you have three children, he's not the fourth. And I know what you're thinking. Well, you need to stop acting like one. I, quit fooling around. Stop. Stop. And this is ours, number 12. Don't demean. Men, don't make your wife feel like the scum of the earth. When I was in California, there was a lady who came up to me. And she said, you know what, I've been, on, I've been on the couch for three days. I said, well, why have you been on the couch three days? She said, because my husband made me feel so bad that I was on the couch for three days. This, is, this woman is gorgeous, and he just made her feel like the scum of the earth. And she was depressed on the couch for three days. Don't do it, man. Don't do it. Number 13, don't force a quiet person to talk. Don't push them into a corner before they're ready to talk. Ladies, you have this bad because, you know, we, men, we have a tough time communicating. Therefore, you get angry, you get mad, and you just, now, now you're in conflict. And so now, you know, everything just comes up and you just, yeah, and you need to talk right now. And you all getting this fake pressing breath. Because cut it out. Don't do this. How would your wife or your husband, how would your spouse Describe your communication skills. What areas would she say you need some help in? Because now we're going to look, look at seven ways to listen. Seven ways to listen to your, sp your spouse. Some things overlap. Seven ways. Number one, listen with your face. Men, we struggle here. We're not listening while we're still watching TV or looking at our phone. We're not listening. <clears throat> Give your wife eye contact. Here's the thing. We, we have this, we, we're, we just can't do it. A, a mother can talk on the phone, cook, wash dishes, and help with homework all at the same time. I don't know how God wired y'all up to do that, that impossible task, because we can only do, as men, we can only do one thing at a time. We can't look at the phone or look at TV and listen to you, too. We can't. We can't. And, and therefore, ladies, I told you, it's not time to talk during the NBA Finals. That's not when we, it's time to talk or doing Sports Center, fooling around. We can't. But what, here's the thing. But here's a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing, the, one of the greatest inventions. We can pause live TV. I think that that's the most incredible. If you're my age and older, I know you're, like, shocked at this like I am. We, we, we remember when we were the remote control. Hey, hey, boy, come on in here. Yeah, 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 Daddy, what you need? Turn that channel for me. <laughs> the, the, the chair is here. The, the TV is right there. And, 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 and we got to turn the channel. Is this it? No, no, keep going. And, and that's if you were lucky to still have that turn. That little plastic thing always breaks, and you have some vice grips. You know, the antenna with the aluminum foil on the top, you know, trying to move it. See, y'all don't, some of the younger people are like, what is he talking about? Uh, so, but good thing we can pause live TV, and, and, and we can listen, so we need to do that. Number two. Do not reason with your mate, meaning men. Don't say, honey, the reason why things are like it is is because of X, Y, and Z. The conversation is over. Goodbye. No, no. Sometimes our wives are not looking for a reason but for us just to hear them out. Number three, do not argue. When you argue, no one is being heard. Number four, do not interrupt. I have this problem bad. Here it is. I'm constantly bringing this up. Because I'm wired to debate. Because I'm wired to debate, sometimes I bring this quality into conflict with my wife. 
And she constantly has to remind me, I was not finished. <laughs> and then I come back and say, you know what, let me answer this point. If I answer this point, you wouldn't have to keep talking because that point is answered and I wasn't finished. And I'm sitting there steaming. <laughs> well, don't, don't do it. I, I have it bad. Number five, do not stomp out the door. Man up, face the conflict. Watch this. Cowards and little children stomp out the door and stomp out the room. You've seen it on, on the TV, on the movies. They stomp out and slam the door, and then the parent go up and knock on the door. Sally, you think I, you think I can come in and we can talk this over? In my house, we would have kicked, boom! Closed, no, you don't slam no doors in my house. Or we wouldn't have got, wouldn't got a screwdriver and, and a hammer, and pick, 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 and took the door off. <laughs> Sally, can, you, can we talk? Can we talk? I knocked that door down. But so little children and cowards walk out. Number six, do not vent to others. This is called breaking trust, meaning talking to other people without your spouse knowing about it. Ladies, you have this bad because you got to talk. You got to tell somebody. Don't vent to others. Because, you know, the guy, he's at, he's at the family reunion. He's, re he's reaching in, grabbing a bottle of water, and he's looking like this. And wonder why everybody's looking at him like this. And he's like, honey, why, why does everybody treat me? I don't know why they treat you. You know why. You broke trust. You went running your lips. Number seven, no rude body language. I can always tell. I can always tell when a couple is in conflict. Even in here, it's funny. You know, I have the great privilege to see everyone right in front of me like this. And I always tell couples in conflict because they sit there and one is going to be like this. I don't even want your shadow to touch me. You're not even worthy for me to even face you or be next to you, so you're going to talk to the back. Oh, I see it all the time. You'd be surprised what I see from up here. Oh, I can see some. <laughs> I see some type of folks that are like, yeah, get them, Pastor Tony, get them. And then when I get them, and they're like, <laughs> looking crazy. So how would your mate describe your listening skills? Which one of these does, you know, which one do you need work on? I have a problem with interrupting. What about you? Is your problem you like to stomp out? You never face your problems. You're always leaving. You just got to leave. I got to leave because if I stay there, because it won't be pretty. And do, you, do you badmouth your spouse to other people or family members? Do you see how much we need God's help? We can't do this on our own. This is impossible. It's impossible. Let me wrap it up with this. What are you sensing God saying to you? Is he saying that you need to forgive your spouse? Is he saying that you need to get some help in communicating or listening better? Maybe you're hearing you're always running home to your mother or stomping out. Because see, that was the thing you did as a kid and nobody checked you on it. And now you're an adult. You, you do it now as an adult. See, we need, to, we need to watch these things. What is God speaking to your heart about this behavior? And finally, men, how will you represent God in the home? How you represent him? Remember, no matter whether you believe it or not and whether you want to accept it or not, you represent God in the home. What kind of mirror are you showing your family how God is? Well, I'm not God. Well, I understand that. I can tell you that. Your wife can tell you that. Shoot. I can tell you that. You're just sitting there. You don't know me. The devil is a liar. I do know you. Because you're just like me. You're wired up just like me, a man. 
And we need help. Because we are given a bad represent, representation of God in the home. We need God's help. And God is here to help us. He's here to give us the power to do what we can't do on our own. He gives us the power to forgive when someone has hurt us and for us to treat them as if the offense never occurred. That, I need help in that area. I need help because I, folks that have hurt me, I, I, I see them, I want, I, I want to treat them nice and treat them, but everything inside of me is just, I struggle. I struggle with that. I struggle with that kind of stuff. Because it's, it's not natural. This is why we need supernatural help. Because it's not natural for us to forgive somebody who's hurt us. You hurt me, I hurt you. But the Bible says, render to no one evil for evil. This is why we need God's help. This is not about, let's come to church, you know, just come to church, you just... No, we want to have an encounter with the living God to help us in our everyday lives. This is not just some Sunday thing we just come and do to get us some more religious information about God. We need an encounter with God because we are a mess. We're a mess. We're a mess. Many of you know you're not right with God, but you didn't come up because you're pride. You know you're not right with God. And you think your pride has told you, ah, oh, if I die right now, I'll stand before God. Oh, he'll, he'll understand. That's your pride. But there are people who came forward. They know, I'm not right with God, but I want to get there. I want to get there. Don't allow your pride to keep you out of heaven. Don't allow your pride to deceive you into thinking, because I come and sit in a chair every now and then, that I'm right with God. All I have to do just ask those closest to you if you're right with God. They'll tell the truth. You can snow us in here. Tell us anything. Act any kind of way. Even try to talk like, you know, pray, praise the Lord. You know you're not right. And you're going to stand before a holy God, the God who created the universe. And you're going to give an account of your life to him. And you know whether you have a life that represents God being in it. Or you just talk. Like Jesus said, they draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And there are many people who do that. They come sit in a chair, and they draw near. You ask them about the Lord. Yeah, I know the Lord, the Lord. A funeral. Oh, they rest in heaven and all kind of mess. No, they're not right with God. You don't know when you're going to be stretched out here. You want to make sure your life is right with the Lord. All you have is today. That's all you have. And you want to make sure that your life is right. You don't know around what corner death is. And you want to make sure you're right. I want to make sure that you're right before you leave here. There's going to be some people to pray with you about these things. These are serious, eternal matters. Your eternal soul. Hangs in the balance right now. Well, God just loves me. He just, he doesn't care what I do. He just loves me anyway. Let me tell you something. There's a verse that a lot of people don't know about. Somewhere in Psalm, Psalm 7, verse 11, around that, that area. It said that God is angry with the wicked every day. And people hear, oh, that's not loving. That's in the Bible. You want to make sure that you're right with this God, and there's going to be some people to pray with you. Maybe you didn't come up the first time, but there's another opportunity. God always gives people an opportunity. Even Judas, who, who betrayed him, he was giving him an opportunity. He came up to Jesus, kissed him, and Jesus said, Judas, you betrayed the Son of Man with a kiss. That was Judas's turn to turn away. He could have said, oh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me for doing this, and Jesus would have forgave him. Are you, God has given you a chance to get it right. And there will be some people to pray with you about these things. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this opportunity. These are your precious people. You love them. You do. 
But Lord, not only are you loving, but you're holy. You're a holy God. And I pray for your people here in the West Auditorium. I pray, God, that you would draw your people to you into a true relationship with you where their lives reflect Jesus Christ being in So, Lord, do a work today. In Jesus' name, amen.